we do want to get to the latest on the Russia-Ukraine war. And for that, we bring in retired Marine Intelligence Officer and National Security Analyst Hal Kempfer. Hal, as always, good to see you. Let's play some video out. Ukrainian troops have withdrawn from the key battleground town of Avtivka in the east of the country, which could pave the way for a Russian advance as the war nears its second anniversary. What we're looking at right now is video from the area taken by Ukraine's 3rd Assault Brigade. Hal, why is Avtivka a key battleground in this fight? Austin, Avdivka is a, uh, generally it's a crossroads area. Uh, it's seen as a possible springboard if they were to move inland. Normally speaking, that would be the case. The, the issue they have is this. Uh, it, it normally would, there's nobody there. It was like 30 some thousand people lived there before the war. It's not a huge city by any means, uh, but it was a built up urban area. Uh, it has been decimated. It's been destroyed, just uh, the, the destruction of all the buildings. People are, are, are pretty much gone. I don't know if anybody who still lives there. And it's just a battlefield. It's an urban space battlefield. What the Russians did was they were desperate for any sort of win and so they focused a phenomenal amount of troops, armor, air power, everything on Avdivka. And only after the USAID ran out, they began running very short on artillery rounds and other ammunition, were the Russians able to use this to make some uh, gains on the battlefield, if you will, in that particular area. The, the problem the Russians have, and they've had this with other areas, is when they do make some of these uh, advances, in places that are historical crossroads, they can't really use them as crossroads because they're still what we call covered by fire. In other words, if they try to move convoys or anything else through there, those uh, those convoys would immediately come under fire. Uh, the ubiquitous nature of drones uh, on the battlefield today, I think uh, last count I saw, uh, Ukraine is using is uh, basically expending 50,000 drones a month. It is phenomenal. And they're building hundreds of thousands of these drones. Some of them are smaller first-person views. Some of them are larger drones that are capable of going uh, hundreds of miles all the way up to uh, St. Petersburg, if you will, all the way to Moscow. So there's a variety of drones. But the drones have changed warfare, and the drones and persistent drones have changed the nature of being able to do logistics, resupply, or, or use some of these what we call lines of communications or major supply routes such as what Avdivka would have historically represented now it doesn't necessarily historically represent that so if you want to look in terms of attrition warfare uh the ukrainians used uh Avdivka for for what it was there to do which was to chew up the russians they've lost tens of thousands of, of troops, thousands and thousands of tanks, artillery, armored vehicles, phenomenal losses. Uh, they've, they've, I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the day, they've lost as many people, maybe not in that city, but certainly in that quadrant, in that area, that is equivalent to what we lost during the entire Vietnam War in terms of personnel. So it just gives you an idea. And of course, um, yeah, last Friday, while, while we're focused on, or yesterday, while everybody was focused on the death of Navalny, they went over 400,000 troops, according to uh, Russia or Ukrainian military intelligence. The Russians have lost 400,000 troops. Even even the more conservative U.S. estimates are somewhere between 350,000 north killed and wounded. Uh, it's it's uh, it's just it's it's an amazing loss rate. And uh, at some point, it does become rather unsustainable that they can do this. But for the time being, until we get that aid coming back in. Ukraine is back to doing what it did earlier in the war, which is trading terrain or battle space for force protection, force survivability. Um, I, I would point out one thing with this. One of the reasons that the Russians were able to make this advance is because they still own the air, if you will, at least across the immediate battlefront. They have a tougher time. They can't fly deep into a Ukrainian territory because it gets shot down, but, but they do close air support using their uh, air assets. And they did that uh, much more extensively in this particular battle than they've done in other battles in the past. And that air support was what enabled them to get an edge. That's gonna change in, in a very short period of time, at least two to four months. That's when we expect those F-16s that are coming in from across Europe, 
all those highly trained Ukrainian pilots that have been out there in various different countries to include the United States getting trained in close air support and other air-to-air -air combat tactics with F-16s. Once those F-16s are flying, that edge that Russia has in terms of aviation will probably turn the other way, and, and that'll be a big change. And uh, keeping with Avdivka, we do also want to mention uh, General Alexander Sirske, who took the helm of the Ukrainian military in a major shakeup last week, announced the withdrawal as a tactical move to save the lives of troops in a town that has been under heavy attack for months. Uh, you know, how, uh, how do we assess one of his first major moves, I believe, in this role? Well, uh, certainly everyone's going to assess it to say, oh, we're, you know, here he comes in on the losing ground. And, and, uh, and certainly, you know, if, if you look at, uh, you know, Saluzny, who he replaced, he was very popular general, but he was a different type of military thinker. He was much more, um, pardon the expression, a little bit more set piece on the battlefield, if you will. Uh, Sierski's different. He's more of a maneuverist. He will mass forces. In fact, he was somewhat famous in uh, Bakhmut for massing forces and making battlefield gains. Now, uh, when you mass forces like that and go into a big fight, you're going to take casualties. And that was something that his predecessor appeared reluctant to do. He didn't want to take any more casualties than they had to. Hence, they didn't make any great gains. Historically on the battlefield, uh, in order to make great gains, you've, you've got to take a lot of operational risk, which... Um, you know, certainly uh, General Sierski is, uh, is, is, is adept at doing. But he's also a smart maneuverist. There was nothing more to be gained. In fact, if he kept his forces there, they were in threat of being encircled by the Russians simply because the Russians had mass. So what he did was he, he pulled them back. In some cases, they may have to make uh, minor offensive actions or attacks in order to secure that 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 uh, tactical withdrawal, if you will, from the city. Uh, but he's pulling them back, and he's going to let them uh, take the city. I have no doubt that wherever they pull back from, they've booby-trapped and mined and done a lot of other things to incur uh, greater casualties on the Russians. They've got every target in the city des you know, uh, designated, so uh, when the Russians move in, they'll be able to call in fire, uh, artillery fire, mortars, other things. Uh, right on top of where those positions, those logical Russian positions would be. So he's going to cause it to be a uh, uh, something of an attrition zone, if you will, uh, for the Russians. So, uh, uh, you know, on the face of it, it's like, oh, he's having a withdrawal. He, he didn't really have a choice. Uh, but, but, I, but I credit him for making a, a timely decision to do something. You know, he didn't just sit there and let his forces get piecemeal decimated or cut off. He said, nope, time to withdraw. I have no doubt in the future when they're when they're flush with ammunition, when the F-16s are flying, <laughs> we're gonna see him making decisions that are the exact opposite. He's gonna mass forces and try to punch through. I wouldn't be surprised if he's looking at that area because they know the terrain so well and thinking that may be one of the areas that they try to punch through in the future is to go through Abdivka, which would be kind of unusual, but to go through the Abdivka area and use that as a uh, potential zone in order to move into uh, uh, eastern Ukraine in mass, and then maybe do some sort of maneuver where they come behind the Russian lines, which uh, I've been hoping they've been doing for, I've been hoping for uh, quite some time over a year that they were able to, able to pull this off. And if they get behind the lines, the Russians don't maneuver very well. And if he can get behind them and cut them off, uh, it's generally thought that the Russian uh, forces on the lines will start to basically disassemble, perhaps fall apart, and uh, and that we could see a, a rapid movement. But Sierski, for all the controversy over his getting into that office, uh, I I have hope that he's going to make some decisions. And this, that from a tactical, from an operational standpoint, I think this was a good decision. When we talk about uh, drones, and, and we were speaking about drones before, but I want to speak about a specific type of drone, FPV drones. Take a look at your screen. Uh, FPV drones have proved to be a hugely important weapon for Ukraine since the start of this war. We're looking at one in action right now. Uh, what are they, Hal, and why has Russia been having some trouble with these lately? Well, uh, FPV means first-person view. 
And if you've ever heard of drone races, uh, which we, you know, we have here in the U.S., we've had them for quite some time, where people put on basically a, uh, a, a uh, uh, basically it's a, a, a like a visor. Uh, it's basically uh, they, they pop it down and they're looking in. Uh, in some cases, it's almost a complete 3D view of what the drone is seeing. And then the uh, pilot, if you will, flies the drone directly into wherever they're going into. These are what they call kamikaze drones. Uh, these are drones that are uh, some call it a, a one-way mission drone where they come right in and they hit the target. Uh, they've had great success. The Ukrainians are very innovative and they have over time been able to overcome Russian electronic warfare uh, capabilities. They've had this problem uh, consistently throughout the war. Uh, you know, the, the, the typical off-the-shelf drone you would buy would not do well in that environment simply because the Russians have the ability to jam the signal. So the drone goes out, loses the signal, and falls to the ground. And that was a big problem for much of this war. Now the Ukrainians have come up with a number of ways to do that. They've also found some deficiencies in the Russian jamming equipment, uh, some uh, gaps, if you will, in their capabilities that they've been able to exploit. And so what they've done is they've been able to use these drones in the same way that they might have used artillery before. And right now they're short on artillery rounds because a lot of that was coming from the United States. So they're using the drones to make up for the shortfall. Obviously these drones are very precise and uh, they can you know, find armor, uh, find troop positions, uh, find all sorts of things and go in there. They don't have a lot of, the, those drones that you're seeing there don't have uh, long legs. They're immediately close to the battlefield, you know, within a few kilometers or so. Uh, they can't go on along. There are drones with much longer legs that can do this, but many of these tactical drones, these uh, smaller drones, are literally being used on the front lines and they're, uh, they're going in there and taking out uh, Russian armor and stuff. Now, the Russians have drones, too, and they've been inflicting casualties, but the Ukrainians have been, uh, at least as far as we can tell, uh, much more adept at dealing with the Russian drones than the Russians are dealing with the Ukrainian drones. And this has provided the Ukrainians a uh, force advantage, if you will. It's a force multiplier in terms of what able, they're able to do, not just tactically on the front lines, but more operationally and going in for deeper strikes, even strategically using some of these uh, longer range drones, uh, which they've developed themselves to fly well into Russia, up into, uh, as I mentioned before, St. Petersburg, Moscow, and other locations. In fact, uh, drones were a huge part of what we saw last week in Volgograd, where they went in there and basically hit the city with missiles, but there are also drones that I understand were accompanying some of that, and they've had some great success in dealing with a key logistics hub uh, that Russia relies on, and these are much deeper strikes. So, so drones, FPVs are a big part of it at the tactical level. Um, I guess you could call some of these longer range drones FPV as well, because they, the pilots can't actually control them and see what the drone is seeing, uh, especially for the intelligence drones. That's they're seeing what they're seeing. Um, but, but these FPV drones, which are literally hobbyist stuff that we see here in the US are being used to great advantage by the Ukrainian armed forces. And my understanding is it's a cheap way to go about their uh, fighting as well. I, I do want to move stateside for a minute. The AP reports that the U.S. House will not feel, quote, rushed to pass the $95 billion foreign aid package for Ukraine, Israel, and other allies, signaling a further stall over sending military hardware and munitions to Kyiv. Speaker Johnson has said uh, the Senate's most recent package does nothing to secure the U.S.-Mexico border, which has been the GOP's priority with this one. I, I want to play some remarks from Senator Ron Johnson, the Republican out of Wisconsin. Let's watch. If we're really going to vote to add $60 billion of fuel to the fire of a bloody stalemate is, what's the result that going to be? The only way this war ends, because Putin is not going to lose this war, the only way it ends is in a negotiated settlement. Now, we don't want to get too much into the politics of the matter, but I want to ask how, is it a fair assessment to say that Russia is too powerful a foe for Ukraine in the long run? Uh, only if you don't understand the operational art of war. Um, and, and let me just say this. 
uh, getting all moral and ethical reasons aside uh, for Ukraine. This is the real politic within Europe, within NATO, and NATO includes the United States, is we're, we're basically destroying the Russian army by proxy, if you will, by providing uh, enough ammunition and arms to Ukraine. The Russians, you know, they could say, well, they can throw all this stuff in there. Yes. And, and I'm sure someone back there would say, knock yourself out, too, while you're at it, and, and put as much as you can. Uh, Russia right now is pulling out tanks out of war stocks that are 60, 70 years old. They're reconditioning them and putting them on the battlefield where they have basically very little survivability. Those FPV drones, some of the armor on those tanks, it doesn't take much of a warhead on an FPV drone to punch a hole in that and basically take that tank out. That's what the Russians are being forced to do. They cannot, with all the sanctioned regimes and everything else, they're not producing a a lot of new T-90 tanks uh, out there. They're not producing a lot of the new uh, newer BMP-3s or anything like that. They're pulling in old vehicles from 50, 60 years ago and putting them on the battlefield and, and they're causing, and they're basically suffering huge losses for that. Uh, what this does for the US and for NATO uh, strategically is by supporting Ukraine, ethically, morally, we're supporting someone who is you know, fighting for their territorial integrity uh, a country that we we all have close relationships with, but the other side too is we're causing the Russians to basically uh, expend its uh, military dividend, if you will, or its military capability in fighting a war that that frankly they can never win the way they define winning. And uh, I would turn that on its head with uh, Senator Johnson and say, there's no way uh, if we support if NATO uh, countries support Ukraine there really is no way for Russia to truly win this war. And they're going to waste a lot of men and material trying to do so. And that's why they're trying to do it. And and certain, certain things on the battlefield, like I talked to you about, all they got to do is punch a hole somewhere in that line where they can force through a lot of this uh, very fast modern armor and everything else that we've provided them. And, uh, and they can literally route large segments of that front line. Everyone knows it. They tried to do it last spring and summer. They could not get through. The minefields and everything else were just too thick. All right, but if they can do that at some point, and at some point they will, maybe F-16s will provide that close air support that they need, uh, have desperately needed in order to pull that off. Uh, This war could change very quickly. And and whereas you hear this naysaying, history is replete with naysaying on war, and then, what happens on the battlefield changes everybody's impression. And, and speaking uh, to the capabilities, it, 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 and I'm sorry to cut you off, but just speaking uh-huh. to the capabilities of the Ukrainian Navy, I mean, we, we're we actually seeing that they're performing pretty well from a naval standpoint, aren't they? We're, we're pulling up this tweet right now saying Ukraine's military says it destroyed a Russian warship off the south coast of Crimea, the latest in a string of operations targeting Kremlin Navy vessels. It appears that on the naval front, Ukraine is doing pretty well, Hal. Uh, not, not just on, uh, on the sea, but in the air as well. The Ukrainian, the Ukrainian uh, naval operations, which is pretty impressive considering they don't actually have what I would call a navy, uh, doesn't ex- actually exist. They have basically destroyed the blockade, uh, defeated the Russian blockade. They have sent the uh, uh, black, the Russian Black Sea Fleet running uh, for uh, for their uh, you know far flung areas and and defending themselves in Russian ports. Uh, they have had to pull pretty much out of Sevastopol, which was their largest port, their largest naval base in the Black Sea, uh, and they've done this through a variety of means, uh, not the least of which is drones. They have used aerial drones to great effect. They took out the, uh, earlier in the war, they took out the uh, Mosfa, which was the, um, you know, the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet for Russia. Uh, more recently, they have been using a variety of uh, seagoing drones. Uh, they have underwater drones. Uh, there's not a lot known about those, but they, we do know they have uh, underwater uh, submersible drones. Uh, they have these surface drones to include drones that essentially operate like uh, basically on, on jet ski concept, if you will in terms of how they move so quickly across the water. 
And what this has done is it's caused the Russians to have to pull their fleet way up, way back. And, uh, and it has done something at sea that I don't think anybody at the beginning of the war ever would have anticipated, which is the Ukrainians, without a navy, without navy warships, have essentially uh, operationally, in terms of their area of responsibility or their area of, of, of operations, have uh, essentially defeated the Russian Navy. And that certainly was not anticipated. And we're starting to see the same thing with the air. You know, they're taking down some of their most advanced fighter bombers, you know, the Su-34s. Uh, you know, they, they, they've taken out a number of their command and control birds, which are similar to our AWAC system. Uh, and they've done this through a variety of weapon systems, but also some very, very clever tactics, uh, some very clever anti-air ambushes as well. So uh, if you look at the air, uh, if you look at what they've done in the sea, that gives you an idea of what the Ukrainians can do. Um, what they need is they just need that thing to punch punch a hole to the lines uh, somewhere in that either eastern Ukraine or somewhere in that Zaporizhia area. And if they can do that, uh, I have no doubt that they could replicate what they've done on the sea, but do it on the ground. I want to move, and this is the last thing we'll touch before we go. Let's just move a little bit away from the battleground. Supporters of Alexei Navalny confirmed his death in an Arctic prison camp, but said that his mother was being prevented from seeing the body of him. Uh, you, you will recall that he's the Russian opposition politician who, who died, uh, and, and Russian authorities said Navalny collapsed after a walk at the prison colony on Friday. He lost consciousness and couldn't be revived. I'll remind our viewers that this was taking place in an Arctic prison far, far up north. They said the cause of death is still being established, according to the Wall Street Journal. Hal, um, the body not being seen, have we seen situations like this before? It obviously leads to some questions. What could be Russia's rationale for not letting the body be seen? They don't want anybody to see the body because they know what state the body is in. Uh, there's a variety of ways. It, it could have been poisoning, in which case there could be telltale visual signs uh, of poisoning. Uh, certainly, I would think uh, his mother would probably know by now what the telltale signs of poisoning look like. It could be, and this is a this is just an educated guess that he could have been. He was outside. He's at uh, a place, you know. Uh, basically, it's in the Ar just below the Arctic Circle. It's in mid-February, and he went outside for a walk. Um, that's suspicious in and of itself, and it's very likely that uh, he could have suffered hypothermia or worse, and, uh, and certainly there would be telltale physical signs from that. I, honestly, I would be dubious if that body is ever returned to the family because one thing that Putin does not want, he does not want a independent autopsy. He doesn't want anything that could turn into a toxicology, even if they were to get, uh, you know, hair uh, from Navalny's uh, body, they could run that for tests and find out if maybe poisoning was involved, at least rule out some things. But uh, I'm, I'm not surprised. In fact, uh, yesterday, uh, I recall we, we talked on the, our, you know, I, I talked on the air about this was uh, uh, that it would be very surprising if they, they allow that body to go back to the family. And, and of course, now they're saying not only they're not gonna let the body go back, they're not even allowing his family members to see the body. And I, I'm not surprised. Now, with that said, it's the Russian uh, penal system. I'm not sure that they have to. Um, once a, uh, someone dies in Russian custody, I don't know if, what rules they have, assuming they'd even follow the rules, in terms of, of uh, returning the remains uh, back to the family. So in this case, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see anything uh, you know, for a very long time, if ever, on him. I would not be surprised if they turned around and, uh, and, and this is just, uh, again, don't know, speculation, but they may cremate his remains in order to minimize the chance that anything could be garnered uh, from whatever they do return. And again, it's the Russian system I'm sure they have a lot of th things that they can do, which would seem rather unusual rules to us, but it's Russia, it's a one-party dictatorship, it's a brutal dictatorship, and certainly if a dictator is gonna kill somebody like this, a high-profile individual, you know, put him into custody, torture him for years, um, at, at, at the very least, uh, they're they gonna try and avoid culpability. I, I, I should mention just one, one thing. 
One is that they, you know, the most optimistic scenario, if they didn't kill him Friday or Thursday or, or their Friday, if they didn't kill him that day, the most optimistic scenario that they have is that all these years of brutal torture where they didn't feed him, where they, you know, they put him on the most severe rations, all the deprivation uh, that he suffered while in custody. The most optimistic scenario is that finally he died from the cumulative effects of that inhuman torture and 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 uh, inhuman imprisonment that he's had to go through. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that they actually ordered an assassination of him. So it does kind of put it in perspective of uh, even the Russians saying, you know, he could have had a blood clot and collapsed. Well, what would cause that? You know, what would be the scenario? I mean, you've had this guy in prison for years. You've tortured him. You deprived him of food. You've, you've done all these other things. Um, it really, there, there is no, there is nothing that the Russians can say that alleviate responsibility for what happened. The two-year anniversary of this segment of the Ukraine-Russia war is approaching next week. Hal Kemper, as always, we appreciate your time this Saturday. Take care. All right. Thank you, Austin.